So let's go ahead and address this now. Uh, Tony, expanded KRAS analysis. Expanded what? Oh, I'm sorry, that's true. It is expanded <laughs> RAS. Thank you, you for are putting right. it out. Well, it's both expanded KRAS and, and other. Ah, so see? You're, you're right the on. moderator. He's mm -hmm. like, you're like you right uh, Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. So, so, Tony, tell us a little bit about this expanded RAS analysis. Why is everybody ha so abuzz about it? So, the, the, the rationale for expanded RAS analysis uh, started from uh, further digging into the significance of an expanded KRAS beyond what we normally do in Exxon 2 and looking at NRAS. And the first hint was actually came from, from COIN and other studies that suggest that it may have a prognostic uh, component added to just KRAS, Exxon 2, Codon 12, Zen 13. Uh, and then as an expansion uh, of the RAS analysis was incorporated in some of uh, the studies looking at EGFR inhibitors, where, whether penitumumab or cetuximab, the suggestion was, well, there were two suggestions. One, that we can select out another 10 to 15 percent of the patients. In other words, that another 10 percent of those patients that belong to the KRAS, traditional KRAS wild type, actually do have other RAS mutations. And those patients do not seem to benefit uh, from the addition of the EGFR inhibitor. In addition to that, which is more, a little bit more concerning, was the suggestion that for some of these patients, if you give them the EGFR inhibitor, that uh, their outcome ends up worse. So not only that they may not respond to the EGFR inhibitor, but actually we may be inducing harm. Uh, and so this is, this is, albeit these are small subsets still of multiple studies, but they're all trending in the same direction, suggesting to us that we should consider expanding that RAS analysis beyond just KRAS exon 2 to 2, 3, 4, and then NRAS um, to actually optimize the use of EGFR inhibitors like cetuximab and penitumumab in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. Tony, can I, can I take objection with one thing you said? should consider. Yeah. I mean, come on, we have to do this. There's so much evidence out there. We sh should not consider. We should do. I and mean, I'll put in a political plug. Um, one of the discussants was quite kind and said we jumped on the original RAS wild type data quickly. I don't think we jumped on it particularly quickly. I think we took a long time to accept that and stop using the agents, and I think patients suffered as a result. So I agree with Axel. This is now mandatory. So I, you know, I, I, I'm not... You're very kind of, you're Switzerland, you know. I, mean. I am, you know... He uh, wants to be the moderator next time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, you know, Lebanon has been called Switzerland and a lot of other things. That's what, But, uh, no, I, I certainly agree. And this reason why I, I say should consider, uh, I think everyone should do it. However, not everyone has the cap capacity and the capability to do it. Uh, so thus, if we actually, and we should all, as a, as a community of oncologists, we should all consider pushing this hard um, to insurers and other payers to actually mandate it as part of uh, the pre-screening. But right now, we have to be practical, and I think everyone should uh, and, and hopefully could uh, do it. Okay, I, Al, I know you want, or Alan, I want so, to. So the one, I, I agree with this, and I think uh, expanded RAS is an appropriate test to do. I think part of the issue, though, is when do we put, where do we put this in play in patients? And it, while absolutely the case that there, we have options that are really uh, numerous, and we, could, we have four ways to go, theoretically, with any patient, either of the chemotherapy backbones with either of the antibodies, the reality is most patients, in the, in the results that we showed, most patients are likely, at least in the U.S., if past history is any hint, are likely to choose not to take cetuximab as first line. It's, at least in our, in our practice, patients are not so enthused about a, a drug that causes a skin rash like this. Now, if, there's a, if the increment is really dramatic with expanded RAS, then th that, of course, needs to be in the mix. But I think we should certainly look at it, and it has impact in second line as well as in first line. Now, remember, in the U.S., the market forces would tell us that 75 percent of patients start with Folfox, as shown in our stu my study, 70, in, in, that st in 8045, 73 percent of patients had Folfox, 27 percent got full fury, and of that 27 percent, uh, about 10 percent of them had failed Folfox adjuvant therapy or had had it earlier, so they were not going to get more Folfox. So, the dominant forces in the U.S. have been Folfox plus Bevacizumab. 
and I don't think this result changes it except to say that there are other options. And, uh, and so I think to me, I put it out to everybody else, what, what kind of increment do you think we need to see to motivate the doctors and patients to accept a, a treatment that, at least at the quality of life analysis, doesn't look, you know, isn't going to be favored by many patients. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I believe though we need to emphasize, and and I think when we see 29.9 month survival, that there is a big impact of continuing therapy beyond first line therapy. Okay. And that the more that happens, the better the outcome. So when we're talking about RAS testing, we have to uh, communicate with the patient, what, what is this continuum of care? What are going to be your options over time? And, and currently, you can't adequately do that unless you know the RAS testing. And so uh, one of the reasons this is now an NCCN guidelines, it's heavily emphasized, is that if we are going to maximize benefit, importantly, patient selection, whether you're going to give anti-EGFR first line, second line, third line, it is a continuum. Your goal should be to offer your patient these options over time as much as possible. And when you do this, we're seeing this profound effect on outcome. So, so Al, tell me, am I hearing you say that we should check the expanded RAS analysis early? That, Is that, that our That's my belief because you, you, need to, uh, you need to communicate with your individual patient. And, and I know my patients often ask, okay, what is the lineup here? How long am I going to be on therapy? What does this mean? What are the choices? And of course, with all the choices we have, it can be a little mind-numbing and overwhelming to patients. But I think if we put this in the context of the continuum of care and what our goal is, which is to select as best we can, and unfortunately, we're limited in selection criteria right now just with RAS, but it is important and we need to communicate that and explain to people that there are multiple options. If we can get you through multiple options and sequence over time, you're going to have the best outcome. Yeah. And, I, and I, I do agree with that, although it, that as we go to second and third line, unfortunately we get into the thorny question of we're, if, if we have determined RAS status on the primary tumor, does any treatment thereafter change it? And we don't know. That's something we're going to look at as best we can. NATO 405, we have about 70 patients who had full FOX adjuvant therapy. A year later or more, they go on to the study, and we have plasma, for example, in those patients to see if we can define RAS mutations present in those patients in the, in the circulating RAS the tumor DNA. I think it's a, it, we, we may get into a, a complexities here, but I agree for, for now the primary would be a, a way to start. I think it's, it's important to realize that, that this isn't a subtle difference. The number of patients who would be excluded from EGFR treatment goes from about 40 percent of patients in, in, with standard RAS mutational analysis maybe to 60 percent of patients. Now, and that's good if they sh it's appropriate to exclude them if they're not going to benefit, but of course that brings more patients into the, into the puzzle who don't have, who have lost an option. So, so th and that's, it, if it's not a good option, that shouldn't be on the table, but of course this, this makes the oncologist, it puts more burden on the oncologist to explain, you know, what we'll do next, and more burden on us to figure out what to do for those patients who can't get uh, EGFR antibodies. So Axel. 